It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Everybody knows that phrase. If you uh, were in high school English class, you had to read A Tale of Two Cities by Dickens. That's probably one of the most uh, well-known first lines of any book that has ever been written, except maybe the Bible in the beginning. I think that might outrank it. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. That is a description of the tribulation period. Now, just to bring you up to date, we saw that in chapter 1, we saw a picture of Jesus. And then the second and third chapters of Revelation are the seven churches of Revelation. And that's the period of time that we're in right now. We are in the church era. We're in the church age. And the next thing that's going to happen to the church is told to us in the fourth and fifth chapters of the book of Revelation. Because there it says, metatauta, after these things, what things? The church. After the church age is finished, the Lord is going to come down, but this is not the second coming of Christ. And the church is going to be taken up and meet Him in the air. 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 15 and 16. So we know that that's the next thing on the agenda is that we call it the rapture of the church. And so for the next seven years, the church is in heaven here on earth. There is no church here on earth. Everything is disrupted. Can you imagine what it would be like if right now the Lord would rapture the church? That means that everyone sitting here today who is a Christian would suddenly disappear and be taken up to meet the Lord in the air. Hopefully that's everyone here. But I don't know it, and you're not. You don't know it for sure either, uh, how many other people. You can't even speak. I can't speak for Jill, and she can't speak for me. I certainly think she's saved. I hope she's saved. And she's probably saying the thing, same thing about me. But the truth of our lives is this, is we can only answer for ourselves. And I am sure that if the Lord would say, come up, that I would be taken up. I've asked a couple of the elders that if that happens, that they go ahead and take over the service. And they said they'd be glad to. <laughs> That's just a joke. That's just a joke. But uh, I, I, I want you to understand that now beginning with chapter 6 through chapter 19, we have a period on the face of the earth. A terrible time. When the Lord begins to cleanse the earth. When the Lord begins to shake up Israel and show them how they're supposed to live and what he expected of them from the beginning. This is a time of tremendous disaster. And by the time we got to the end of chapter 6, it tells us that one fourth of the world, if it would come right now to be almost two billion people, would be killed in the first three and a half years of the tribulation. Chapter 6 ends with the beginning of the last three and a half years. This is the time of great tribulation. Or as it says in the Old Testament, the time of Jacob's trouble. Or the same thing, another way to say it is that from the book of Daniel. This is Daniel's 70th week. A week of years. Seven years. And so that's the great that's the tribulation period, the last three and a half, the great tribulation period. Now we saw a couple of things in the end of chapter 6 that kind of perplexed us. Do you remember we saw a picture of heaven and underneath the throne, or in front of the throne, was the great brazen altar. And underneath the altar were a bunch of saints, martyrs, People who had their lives taken because they were Christians. And they're crying out to God, how long, O oh Lord? And we ask the question, where did these people come from? Where are they from? And the answer is, these are those that came out of the great tribulation. So now we have moved through three and a half years 
And suddenly we see this brazen altar in heaven. And we see these martyred souls underneath crying out for vengeance. And then it ends like this. That all of the great captains and the kings and the noblemen and the poor and the slaves. Everyone is going to see this terrible time of the Lord. And they're going to cry out and say, Lord, send the rocks and the mountains to fall upon us. Give us a place to hide. And the truth is there will be no place to hide. Then the last verse of chapter 6 says this, and listen carefully to the question. For the great day of his wrath, the wrath of the Lamb, has come. And who is able to stay? He says, is there anyone who is going to be able to endure life on earth during this tribulation period? Now, I said that we take the book chronologically. And that's true. But at the end of chapter 6, we have reached the sixth seal. And you know there are seven seals. And in the seventh seal are the seven trumpets. And in the seventh trumpet, of course, are the seven bowls. And all of these are representative of some wrath that God is sending down to punish all of those who are left after the, rap uh, after the rapture. Christ rejecting sinners. And he is punishing the world and the flesh and the devil of all of those who are left behind. It's a horrible time. There's disaster everywhere. Mountains are moved out of their place. Islands disappear. Suddenly the moon and the stars are, are darkened and the moon turns to blood and the stars fall from the sky and the water's going to be poisoned. It's a horrible time. And so he is asked a question at the end of chapter 6. And finally, I am here. Who shall be able to stand? And so chapter 7 is a parenthetical statement. He pushes the pause button because he knows he has said some things that need further explanation. And by the way, there are at least five times in the chronological aspect of the book of Revelation where John pushes the pause button and slips in a parenthetical saying so that we can understand what has just happened. So now we have come through the first six seals. We have seen the devastation. We have seen what's going to happen upon the face of the earth and people crying out in the midst of this and everyone is running around in terror and suddenly he says there are these souls who are martyred under the altar and there's all of this horrendous, terrible things going on on earth. Who shall be able to stand? We're going to find out that during the tribulation period, there are two groups that will be able to stand. That means withstand the judgments of God. Let's read a little bit. Revelation 7, 1. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. People who uh, want to make fun of the Bible, they turn right here, Revelation 7, 1, because they say this, how ignorant. How could anyone today accept the Bible as true because we know the earth is round. And here... He says, four angels are holding the four corners of the earth. They thought the earth was flat. If it can't get this thing right, how can it get anything right? Well, first of all, I've already pointed out to you that back in Isaiah, he, the Lord makes it very clear that as the creator of the universe, that he sets upon the circle of the earth. The Bible declares that the, that the earth is a circle long before science ever discovered what he is doing here is giving us a poetic phrase. We use them all the time. As a matter of fact, a few years ago, the Marines had a recruiting uh, deal on TV. Do you remember that? Join the Marine. See the world. We have troops in the four corners of the earth. Are you telling me that uh, it is so ignorant, that the Marines are so ignorant, they think that the earth is flat? I don't think so. But he talks about the four corners of the earth. The hum is back. 
So it's, it's interesting, though, that we, we use this kind of phraseology all the time. I had, I'll tell you, my favorite, I shouldn't tell you this, by, but my favorite newscaster is the uh, weekend girl in the mornings on Channel 3. Have you ever seen the weather girl on there? Now, she just started a couple of months ago, and she must have been fresh out of school. She's just cute as a button. She's a little tiny thing, and she got so nervous when she's on TV. Now, she's from Oklahoma. That explains a lot. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and anyhow, <laughs> she's from Oklahoma, and, and she, she'd talk real fast, and she just, she wouldn't take a breath. And, and I used to get Jill up just to come out and watch her. Because she, she was hilarious. Now, she's real good now. It's just a couple months, and, and she's gotten really, really good. But the first few uh, weeks, maybe a month or so, she's just a lot of fun to watch. She said, and it's going to break down. And you can hear gold all the way, you know. And I thought, this, this is wonderful. Jill, get up. You have got to see this girl. So, but here's, here's what she said. I guess she, she graduated with high marks from college in Oklahoma. And uh, yet this educated girl said this, tomorrow morning the sun is going to rise at 5.58. What? You mean to tell me she went to college and she is so stupid she thinks the sun rises? We know that the earth is round. The sun doesn't rise. The earth rotates. Is she stu and you think, Jim, shut up. She is just using a colloquialism and, and a phraseology that's familiar with us. She's not really saying that the sun is going to rise or the sun is going to set. She is just simply using a way of saying this is when we're first going to see the sun. Well, why can we give a little girl from Oklahoma, give her a little leeway like that, and somehow we find it difficult ourselves to understand that when he says the four corners of the earth, he might be saying this, that he's holding back the judgments of God from the north, the east, the south, and the west. Well, if I take that long on everything, we'll be here. Why? Here we go. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel descending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom he was, it was granted them to hurt the, uh, to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Now most of the time when we talk about sealing with a mark, most people think of 666 and the sealing that the Antichrist does. But that's just a copy of this. These angels are from God. And he holds back the judgments momentarily because he says these angels are coming down and they want to seal someone, which means put on the mark of God. They're going through a horrible time here on earth, but I want some people preserved. I do not want them harmed. I stand behind them with all the hosts of heaven and the might of Almighty God himself, and this is his mark. We understand marks. For instance, the seals themselves were probably little drips of wax and you take a signet ring and place it in there and that was a seal. You remember when uh, Jesus was placed in the tomb, they took some clay and, and uh, on one end and strapped a, a strap of leather across the, the stone that, uh, that hid Jesus and another piece of clay there to hold it in place and the same went in an X form and then they took a large piece of clay and they put it where those two bands crossed and they took a great big insignia or a mark and pressed it in there that it was a symbol, probably an eagle, of the Roman government. And that means if you touch this, the power of Rome is protecting this place. Do not touch this tomb. 
we are familiar with those marks. Here, an angel comes down to place a mark upon someone, and it's very, very important that we understand who they are and what the mark is all about. Now this, by the way, uh, most of the book of Revelation, almost all of the book of Revelation, is taken from the Old Testament. I know that you know that. There's a familiar passage in uh, the book of Ezekiel, I believe it is, that tells us that uh, this has happened before. Do you remember when Israel rebelled against God? And do you remember they were in uh, Jerusalem? And this was, uh, they were rebelling against God and God was angry with them. But there were a few people who were broken hearted when they looked around at the sin that was in Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, when they saw their neighbors lying and cheating and stealing and lusting and all of the, the covetousness and the, the ways they were breaking the commandments, there were some Israelites in Jerusalem who were mourning and crying and lamenting over the fact that their friends and neighbors were in such a sinful state but they pleased God and God sent six angels to destroy the people of Jerusalem but before he did you remember this he sent forth one of the angels and he had an ink horn and he was to go to those people who were sorrowful over what happened what was happening in Jerusalem and put a mark on their foreheads so they would not be hurt that's what's happening here the seal of the strength of God. All of the bad things that are happening. This seal that is upon their forehead. And by the way, in that Old Testament package, uh, passage uh, from Ezekiel, that word seal, the mark translated means a cross. So here in the Old Testament, before Christ even died, the way they were saved as Jews in Jerusalem, the mourners over the sinful condition of the people, were saved by putting a cross on their forehead. Maybe that's what this looked like. I'm not sure what it looked like. But whatever it was, it was the power of heaven to preserve these people that were being marked by Almighty God. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth and the sea, uh, the earth and the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God upon their forehead. Now, are you ready for the big verse? This is probably what you've all wanted to know. I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. All of us have heard that number. That those that are sealed or protected during this tribulation time are in fact, are you ready? Jews. Oh, I know there's been great controversy about it. You know what the Jehovah Witnesses say? They say they're the 144,000. The uh, Seventh-day Adventists when Ellen White first started, she said, we are the 144,000. Uh, Garner Ted Armstrong, if you remember that weirdo, said, uh, my followers are the 144,000. There have been many, many who have claimed to be the 144,000, almost all of them Gentiles, and may I say to you, without fear of successful contradiction, that the 144,000 are 144,000 Jews. It couldn't be more clear. As a matter of fact, the next few verses tell us that there are 12 tribes. Now, who's that? Israel. And of those 12 tribes, there's going to be uh, 12,000. Listen to what it says. Uh, he says, in verse seven, uh, 4, rather, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Of the tribe of Judah, 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad. 
This is absolutely no doubt about it that it must be Jews. Now, a lot of people say, well, Jim, i got a problem with that. I mean, the Jews have rejected Christ and the gospel has had to go to the, to the Gentiles. Isn't that true? Yes. Well, why would he use 144,000 Jews? Isn't he through with them? And people who say that God is through with the Jews have never read the Bible. The Jews are God's chosen people. The church has not taken the place of the Jews. We may be referred to in a couple of the epistles as spiritual Israel, but physically Israel, the true physical Jewish nation, they are the chosen of God. Now I want you to follow this. When God chose the Jews, it was for one purpose, and that was to be a light unto the Gentiles. In other words, the Jews weren't always to, weren't supposed to be going around, see how much more God loves us than He loves you? We're the chosen people, and therefore we're all saved and you're not. God's intention was for them to be evangelistic witnesses of the fact that there is one true God and that's what they were supposed to do and that's what they failed to do. And God then finally set them aside. And it's true today that there's not a lot of believing Jews as far as Christianity is concerned, but there might be more than you think. As a matter of fact, when it comes to the time of the tribulation, there's 12,000 in 12 tribes that are Jews that receive the mark on their forehead. And what is happening here is that God is going to use the Jewish nation again to evangelize what's left of this world. All of the sin in the midst of all of the disaster, in the midst of all of the, the terrible things that are going on. These Jews are going to become, become evangelistic and they're going to win thousands of people because the next verse says they win so many that it's a great multitude that no one can count. Now you say, I don't like that. I don't like the idea of, of God using the Jews again. He's taking his hand off the Jews. Have you read the same Bible that I've read? As a matter of fact, if you read the book of Romans, the first eight chapters, tell us about how we are supposed to live. And chapters 9, 10, 11 tell us what's next for the Jews. That's what it's all about. That's what the book of Romans really pivots on. But here, God uses converted Jews, people who have seen the light. I don't know how they got the message. Some people think later on in the book, you know, we're going to have a parenthetical expression or a, a season when we see very clearly that what happens is there are two evangelists that are sent from God and maybe they are Jews that are converted after the preaching of these two. No one knows for sure who they are. But that may be the reason they came. But here's what I know. During this time in the tribulation, God is going to use the Jews. And there's going to use 144,000 of them. Not one of them a Mormon. Not one of them a Seventh-day Adventist. That these are Jews given the tribe specifically that they came from. Now you say, who ever heard of a Jew being a Christian evangelist? Have you ever heard of the Apostle Paul? He was somewhat of an evangelist, wasn't he? Can, and did you see the, the disciples, by the way, I mentioned this morning in Sunday school class, they were all Jews. And they ask about them, who are these people that have turned the world upside down? They're all Jews, all the disciples. Paul was a Jew. They were, they were evangelistic. Can you imagine 144,000 Pauls, Apostle Pauls, going into all the world and preaching? Plus, there's going to be an angel that circles the earth proclaiming the gospel message of the Lord Jesus Christ. These things are going to happen. And when they preach, there's going to be multitudes saved. But the 144,000 
are all Jews preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I said at the beginning, this is the best of times. This is the worst of times. These seven years are the worst punishment and judgment that God has ever sent upon this earth. But during this time, it's also the best of times. Because I believe that during this seven years of tribulation, there are going to be more people won to Christ than in all of history before that time. It's the best of times. It's the worst of times. I've got a couple minutes. I'll keep you a few minutes longer. You don't have anything to do, but there's no TV anyhow, so... Here we go. And after these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number. And all the nations, tribes, peoples, tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. Listen to what else says. And crying out with a loud voice saying salvation belongs to God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be our God forever and ever. Amen. Well, what's happening? Well, these people, once they're saved, Here's the problem with getting saved during this time. There's a really good chance you're going to get killed. I've heard people say, well, if, if everything's like you say, Jim, I think I'll just wait till the church is raptured and I'll go ahead and live you know, any way I want to. I'll accept Christ during that time. I wouldn't advise it. Because almost immediately, you're going to be martyred. If you accept Christ, your life is going, you're going to have to live through that trigger. You know where the church is? If you accept Christ, now you're part of the church. You're tucked away in heaven in a great party and a great time of reward. This is a wonderful thing that's happening in heaven down here on earth. Oh, there's going to be a lot of people saved, but uh, almost right away their heads are going to roll. Now we see them in heaven. And we also recognize something else. I, I don't have time to read it all because my time's almost gone. But I, I, I want to, I'll just mention this to you. You go home and study it for yourself. That what happens here is that this wonderful time of uh, celebration in heaven looks like this. We're going to see in just a moment that an elder, the 24 elders are around the throne with the four creatures. Those 24 elders represent the church. You know what the church is going to be doing in heaven? right after it's raptured, we're going to be seated with Christ in heaven on His throne, reigning with Him. That's what the promise is. What happens to these who are saved during the tribulation? A couple of things. One is, they are in heaven just like we are. But they aren't sitting down. They're standing up. They're praising God like we are, but they're just waving their palms. <laughs> I remember that little boy who said that uh, he came out in Sunday school on the, on the Sunday when Jesus was, they were depicting Christ entering in, riding on the donkey, singing Hosanna in the highest, and they're all supposed to wave their palms. And he came out and he refused to take a branch, and he went like this, and he said, what are you doing? He said, I'm waving my palms. Okay, I thought it was funny. Anyhow. <laughs> But they have palm branches and they're, they're standing. And the Bible says that in heaven, instead of sitting with Christ, those that are redeemed during this time are going to be serving Christ throughout all eternity. I can give you a lot more reason to accept Christ today than rolling the dice and gambling on accepting Him. And by the way, you say, well, Jim, are you saying that there's a second chance isn't that an interesting question? The answer is, of course, there's absolutely not a second chance. You mean that if the Lord raptures the church and someone uh, is here on earth and they're not raptured with the church that, and they accept Jesus Christ after the rapture, that isn't a second chance? Absolutely not. How long do we have before time runs out on the gospel message? until the second coming 
of Jesus Christ. You know that. You've heard it for years. You've heard preachers preach it. You've studied it for years. It's not a second chance. It's true the church is gone. But there is the preaching of the 144,000. It is a different way, but it's the same gospel. It's the same Christ. It's the same blood that's been shed for them because it says that they have had their robes washed in the blood of the Lamb. That they are indeed saved. It's not a second chance. We have until Christ comes again or until we die. When we die, our opportunities are over. But if we live through the rapture and we're not saved, and we live during this seven years, we can still be saved. It's not a second chance. still the first chance because Christ hasn't come. The rapture is not the second coming. Jesus comes down, doesn't touch the earth, He goes back. But when Christ comes back and brings His church and reigns upon this earth, then there's no more opportunity to be saved. Okay. There's just a lot of things that I, that I wanted to tell you about that. Let me read real quick. i got a couple of minutes. Then one of the elders, verse 13, answered saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. In other words, I don't know, but you've got the answer. What's this elder doing? I'll tell you what any good elder does. He asks a question so that he can give the answer. A lot of people are saying, well, I'm just waiting. I've, I've been studying, and if someone asked me about salvation, I am ready. That's uh, not the point. The idea is that if you really love the Lord, you find ways to witness to people. Here is an elder which represents someone from, from the church in heaven. And John is looking at him, and uh, he asked John a question. And the question is this, who are these arrayed in white robes and where do they come from? And, and of course, <laughs> the answer, the answer, John says, well, I don't know, who are they? You know. It's asking a question so that he can teach them. And so in verse 14 it says, Then I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones. You don't think that this is through the preaching of the 144,000? These people are the converts. It says these are the ones that came out of the great tribulation, washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God, and serve Him day and night in His temple, and He who sits on the throne will dwell among them. Now listen to what the promise is here. And by the way, those souls, those martyrs underneath the throne... These are the ones. The majority of them were martyred as soon as they became a Christian. You wondered in chapter 6 who the ones underneath the brazen altar are crying out for vengeance. It's these who have come out of the great tribulation. So here's what it says in verse 16. They shall neither hunger no more. Now here's the promise. Listen to this. It's one of the greatest promises in the Bible. Listen to this. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. Now listen to this. And God shall wipe away every tear from their eye. You have it pretty rough right now. Things hard financially. You have difficulty with your kids, with your home life. You look around you and you see this COVID deal and don't understand what's going on and you're just a little bit frightened by it as the death toll rises. We look and we are confused and we can be hurt and we can be, be wandering and yet here is the promise. Here is some hope. I want to tell you from studying Revelation what I think it means when it says, And God shall wipe away the tears from their eyes. I think that it means that heaven is going to be so wonderful and all of your needs and anything you can ever hope for will be provided by God and even more that you cannot even imagine. Paul promised that, didn't he? The human tongue couldn't describe what it's like. It's going to be so wonderful and all of the heartache 
and all of the heartbreak that took place upon this earth, God is going to reach down and wipe away the tears from your eyes. I think that means several things. I think it means that we're going to be in a luxurious place, being loved by God, and taken care of by God. I also think that it means that's the promise of never shedding a tear in heaven. That's the promise of never having heartache again or being broken hearted again. But that's also a promise I think that we won't remember people who aren't there. I can give you a long sermon on that, but my time's up. But did you ever wonder if you went to heaven and your husband or your wife or your kids aren't there? How could how could you ever enjoy heaven? I think when he wipes away the tears from our eyes, it doesn't just mean taking away the punishment and heartache. I think it means taking away all the memories of anything that would make us brokenhearted in heaven. God shall wipe away every tear from their eye. When I was just a little boy, a preacher, a Nazarene evangelist came to our church. And uh, it was an interesting time. I was very small, but he told about something that he saw happen in the hospital. I don't know if it actually happened, but I believe that it did. He said there was an old couple who had been together for many, many years. And she was dying. And he was sitting, sitting attentively in a chair close to her bed holding her hand. And she closed her eyes for a few moments and uh, almost seemed to, to pass out and, and opened her eyes again and looked at him. And said, honey, I love you. He said, I love you too. And they both knew that death was near. And as she looked at him, a tear rolled down her cheek. He reached in his pocket and he got his handkerchief and he reached over like this and he wiped her tear away and he said, Honey, that's the last time. He knew that she was soon going to be in heaven. And God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. That's the reward of those saved by the evangelistic efforts of the 144,000. That is a promise given to the church that's already seated on the throne and reigning with Christ in heaven. We've got a wonderful God. Let's stand together as we say.